<laughs> Michael Mommert graduated in physics from the University of Heidelberg, uh, Germany in uh, 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 2009 and received a PhD degree in Earth Sciences from Free University Berlin, Germany 2013. Currently, he is assistant professor for computer vision at the School of Computer Science at the University of uh, St. Gallen, uh, Switzerland. He, uh, his research focuses on the intersection of computer remote sensing with an, an emphasis on data efficient deep learning methods. Before joining uh, the University of St. Gallen in uh, 2020, uh, he conducted research in uh, solar system astronomy at Lowell Obs Observatory and Northern Arizona University, Flagstaff, USA. So that's your brief cu curriculum. This presentation is entitled Liberty Efficient Deep Learning in Remote Sensing. I'm very curious to, to attend to your uh, lesson to understand more about these uh, this uh, presentation and this lesson that you will uh, do in a very short while. Uh, this will be uh, divided into two parts. The first part is a theoretical part. The second part is a more practical part with the hands on session uh, that is very interesting. We think that these kind of lessons are, uh, are great because you see theory, you see from theory to practice the related topic. So it's something that uh, is quite helpful for our students and for our audience today. So thank you so much again to be here. And uh, Michael, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Gemini, for the introduction. Thank you, Sylvia, for the kind words. And thank you uh, to the organizing committee for having me here today. It's a great honor to speak in front of uh, you guys and tell you something about label efficient deep learning and remote sensing. So as Gemini mentioned, um, there will be a practical part, there will be a theoretical part, but um, to, so that the second part, the hands-on part, will not be as dry because we'll go through some code and I will tell you what, what's gonna happen there. Um, I decided to kind of mix the two. So we'll talk a little bit about the theory and then we, we switch to, the, to a Jupyter notebook and we can talk about the code. And uh, if there is any questions, you can ask me. And yeah, right. So this is supposed, or this is supposed. This is a summer school. You guys are supposed to learn something. So if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Okay? There are no stupid questions. You all come from different backgrounds. You all have different expertise when it comes to deep learning. So if you have questions, let me know anytime. Right? Just raise a hand or yell or whatever. We'll we'll figure it out. Okay, since we're talking about deep learning, who has used deep learning before? Who has never done deep learning? But you are probably super interested, right? <laughs> you will learn everything about it. Okay, excellent. So the idea here is that um, we, we start by, well, an introduction into deep learning, basically, how is it done? So we will establish a pipeline that you can use. The code that we will talk about here, it's freely available, you can take it home, you can use it for your own research. That's why we're doing this, right? This, that's why we have a practical part. I show you how to do certain things with the data that we have here, but then you should be able to more or less easily adapt this code to your own applications. That's the idea. So. We begin by setting up a supervised learning pipeline. We'll see in a second what supervised learning is. Um, for deep learning, we will train a simple neural network to do image classification for land use, uh, no, sorry, climate zone classification. And then we will build on top of this code base that we then have to implement some methods that make this learning process more efficient in different ways. And, this, again, this is an introduction, so I will introduce these different methods, and then you can take them home, you can use them for your own research, and you can build on top of what you have, right? So this is like the building stock, like little, build, or you will see that those are little building blocks that, like Lego blocks, you can, top, you can put on top of each other and then use that to solve different tasks, okay? Who has used PyTorch before or Python? Okay, Python in general? 
kind of common knowledge to some extent, who has never used Python before? <laughs> okay, you will learn a lot today. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Um, yeah, if you have questions, then let me know. Or if it's too many questions, we can do it later, yeah? Um, but we'll figure something out. Okay, so the code will be in Python. We will use PyTorch, which is a, which is a framework for deep learning in Python. It's um, nice to use. A lot of researchers use it. You can use it for whatever you want. It's freely available. And we will use PyTorch Lightning, which is a layer on top of PyTorch to make it use a bit more, yeah, even easier, right? To, to, so that you don't have to um, care about those tiny little details in the, in the bookkeeping process and stuff like that. All right, shall we get started? Let's go. Maybe we don't. Did it freeze? Oh, down, not right. Okay. That's an important detail, but that used to, that works. Funny, anyway. Um, right, so let's start with a little bit of introduction. So here we'll talk mainly about supervised learning, what it is, and how we can use deep learning in supervised learning. Before, let's do a little bit of motivation why we're even talking about this. So deep learning for Earth observation. As you know, Earth observation data are highly complex, right? So there's a huge amount of data and there is different, or there are different data modalities. And many of these data modalities, as you can see here, are image-like data. So you have um, unstructured data, right? Extracting information from unstructured data is a non-trivial task, so you need some methods that can deal with this type of data and with the amount of data. So how do we analyze these data? We need something, a method that is flexible and that is scalable, and deep learning has shown that it is scalable to large amounts of data, so it's very useful for analyzing large amounts of data, and it has shown to have the flexibility to deal with many different tasks. So just some examples from our own research here. Here we do classification on different power plant types. So that's image level classification. Here we do regression on a pixel level for road traffic noise estimation. Here we use uh, semantic segmentation to look for the outlines of um, open pit mining areas. And you can do object detection where you find little um, objects, in this case, they look like little rainbows and they're actually moving trucks from Sentinel-2 data. So there's a lot of different tasks that you can tackle with deep learning and it is scalable. You can apply these methods to huge amounts of data, right? Of course, you need big machines for that, but at least it's possible, right? With, with some more traditional methods, it's, it's more difficult to turn through large amounts of data. Okay, so the question is, how does it work? And the, in most cases, the learning paradigm that you would use to solve these problems is called supervised learning. So the idea here is that you have a machine and you want to teach that machine to solve a specific task. So the machine learns from annotated example. That's the supervised part here. You supervise the machine in learning something. So you provide examples to the machine. And those are those annotated examples. So mathematically, that means this machine learns a function f that maps input data x to some output, right? So this is what you, the input that you provide to the machine, like a satellite image. And then the output here could be a label, is there a power plant in this image or not, right? And basically the machine simply learns this function f that does this mapping here by itself. So that in the future, if you provide even more examples or satellite images in general, you provide it to the machine, the machine will be able to um, solve this problem by itself and tell you whether there's power plants in this image or not, because that's what we want to achieve. A machine that um, performs a task for us. How does it do that? Well, the machine has to store some knowledge, right? And this is stored in these parameters, theta we call them. These are the parameters of the model. 
We will see later where those are and, and what they are. But basically, this is it. Mathematically, it's super easy. It's just a mapping from input to output. You just have to define what is our input, what is our output, and then the machine will have to learn what are those parameters. This is really abstract. We get into more detail. So how does it learn that? We need some input data, and we need some output data, and we need labeled examples. So we have a training data set, we call it typically, with many, many examples of what the machine is supposed to solve, what the task of the machine um, is. So that um, you provide some training input, some satellite images to the machine, and that's not just 10 images or 100 images. In the case of deep learning, we're talking about a couple of thousand examples in, in most cases. Better 10,000, even better 100,000. The more data, typically, the better the results of your model. So you provide this training data set consisting of input data and output. So for each of those samples you have in your uh, training data set, you have to have a satellite image and you have, the have to have the corresponding label. Right? So for each of those examples, you have to know, is there a power plant in there or not? Okay? This is why. This is the output that the machine will learn in the future, but it has to learn it somehow, and that is based on this training data set. So that in the future, once the machine learns this function f from the training data, the machine can then apply this function to unseen data, previously unseen data. So we, let's say the, we, our satellite now maps a completely different region of the Earth. We have new data, and we can run this data through this model here to give us the output without human supervision. That's the important part here. The machine learns to do it by itself and then can perform the task by itself. And in, in the best case, if the machine does a good job, we can trust the machine in this. If the machine tells us there is a power plant, there is no power plant, we can trust the machine. That's what we want to achieve. Okay? Right. So, this is somewhat clear. This is supervised learning. You provide examples to the machine and then the machine can do the task. Now, what, what is f? What is this function that we, we use here? In the, we will, in the future, we will not call it a function, or from now on, we will call it a model. So it's not really just a mathematical function. It's a really complex um, construct. And in most cases, what we use here, especially in deep learning, is this so-called neural network. <clears throat> and a neural network, in the end, is just a cascade of mathematical functions. So you have this layered setup here with an input layer where the data comes in, the input data. The input data is then being processed in those different layers up to the output layer where you get your result. In our case, power plant or no power plant. Okay? So each of those little dots here represents a neuron. That's why it's called a neural network. A neuron is, again, it's a, it's a pretty simple mathematical function. It's just a dot product in the end that takes the input of each of those neurons, multiplies it with uh, a weight vector, or um, a vector of parameters, um, does a bias correction, and then um, it goes through a um, um, nonlinear activation function in most cases, and then you get an output, and that output goes into the next layer of neurons, right? So the neurons are stacked in those layers here, and each neuron takes the input of the previous layer to generate the output, which is the input for the next layer. And then you have a bunch of those layers, and at the end, there is one signal that is left, and that hopefully is the result that you're interested in. So this is the simplest type of neural network. This is a fully connected neural network. What we're dealing with here is a little bit more complex, but in the end, it follows the same idea that you have those neurons in here that have parameters, and the theta, the parameters that this math mathematical function will learn are actually pra the parameters in those individual neurons, okay? So if you have a network that is large enough you can easily have um, networks with millions or even billions of parameters. 
right? That makes it kind of complex to train those models. Okay, is so this kind of clear? This is just very high level, but I think if, you, if you've never heard about this, this is probably good enough. Okay, so we know what we want to do. We know what architecture we want to use. So the question is now, how can we make the model learn? So how can we make the model adjust those parameters in such a way that it can actually solve a task? And there's the, um, there's a pipeline, and basically in the, probably in the next half hour at least, we will build up this pipeline in PyTorch so that we can use a model to do supervised learning, okay? So what do we do? So from our training data set, we sample input data X and labels Y in a batch or mini batch. A mini batch is simply just, you have, uh, you have your data set that has 10,000 images and corresponding labels. So in your mini batch, you will sample, let's say, 10 of those at a time. So instead of running each image with corresponding labels separately through this network, you will combine them in little chunks, and we call those mini batches. Right? So 10 images plus the 10 corresponding labels. The so 10 images go into X, that's our X, and Y is the 10 labels. Okay. Now what we will do is we will run the input through our network. This is called a forward pass. Let me move. That's better. Okay. So we will run the input data through our network, through all the neurons and the different layers. This is called the forward pass. And we will end up with a prediction from our model. Once we start training this model, this prediction is most likely useless because the model hasn't learned anything, right? If we start from scratch, then the parameters in here, everything is, in the end, in most cases it will be randomized or it will follow some, some schema, but it's kind of useless. So when we start training, this prediction is useless, but in the future we want this prediction to be the same as this y. Okay? Because this is the ground truth. This is what we know. And we want the model to have this prediction similar to this y. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it should be as good as possible. It should be as close as possible. In our examples of the power plants, let's say we have 10 images, 10 satellite images that we run through here. Two out of those have a power plant. Eight do not have a power plant, and we want this prediction to show, to indicate exactly those two power plants that, uh, or th sorry, those two images that have a power plant in them. <coughs> we want the model to say, yes, there is a power plant. For the others, there should be no power plant. Okay, so we make the prediction. If it's useful or not, it doesn't matter right now. But what we can do is we can compute a loss on the prediction and our target. So the target is our Y, our ground truth. So we take the prediction and we take the y, we feed it into a loss function. So this is the key here. The loss function basically tells us how good this prediction is. If the prediction is really bad, this loss is high, right? A loss is a bad thing. So the higher the loss, the, the, the worse the outcome of our model. So if the loss is high, we know that the model is performing poorly. If the loss is really low, then those two agree already very well, that the model is doing something right. So this is simply a means to tell us and the machine whether it's performing well or not. Okay? In the end, the result of this entire training process and this entire pipeline will be that um, we um, end up with a model that performs well and performs with a low loss on examples that we provide to it. Okay, that's what we want. Okay, so we have the loss. Now, what do we do with the loss? So, another key to training this network is how can we use this information, how well the model performs 
on a specific data sample or a specific mini batch? How can we use that to improve the model? And what we do here is we use backpropagation and compute the weights the partial, in the end, the, the partial derivatives of the loss function with respect to every single weight parameter that we have here. Okay, this, this is kind of complicated, but in the end what happens is you, you calculate the partial derivative of this loss with respect to the first weight in here, the second weight in here, the third weight in here, the first weight in here, the second weight, and so on, right? And the idea is simply, what, what does this tell us, the partial derivatives? It tells us, how would I have to change this weight here to reduce the loss? This is what, what will help us to train the model. Because if we know how we have to change all these individual weight parameters for this given mini batch, then this allows us to improve the model if it does the right thing, right? If it works properly. If you have if you set it up wrongly or if you have the wrong data, then it will not help. But if you do it properly, it will allow you to improve the model with time. So we calculate these gradients with Bragg propagation and then based on this information, we can modify all those weights in such a way that they, next time you run a mini batch through the network, hopefully the results will be better the predictions will be better, and the loss will be lower. Okay, that's the idea here. And you'll see that actually this is what's gonna happen, it's at least for the training data. In, in most cases, um, the model will perform better. Right, so in the end, why, why do we do all this? Because this allows us to cast this training process as a mathematical optimization problem. This is something that is tangible with math. Otherwise, if, if we would not have this, and this was actually back in the days before we had GPUs, this was one of the big issues why we couldn't train neural networks because there was no way to systematically train them in such a way that they improve with time. You could turn a knob here, you could turn a knob there and hope that it gets better. But this really is a systematic way to improve the predictions from the model. Okay, so we run through, we do a forward pass, we get a prediction, we calculate the loss between our target and the predictions, we calculate the gradient, we modify the weights. This is one iteration, we call it, and we repeat this for all the mini batches that we have in our training data set and this is what we call one epoch. So once we churn through our entire training data set, this is one epoch, and typically you repeat this process for many epochs, sometimes it's five epochs, sometimes it's 500 or thousands of epochs. It really depends on the data, on the task, on the problem. So you repeat this process and you check basically a number of metrics, including the loss, the loss as, as a function of the epoch or the, the number of iterations for which you have trained, the loss should decrease. And metrics like, let's say, accuracy or the F1 score, so they should go up, right? And then you basically have to check, um, yeah, you repeat this for a specific number of uh, epochs, you monitor the training and validation loss and, and metrics so that you prevent overfitting from kicking in. What is overfitting? Overfitting in the end means that your model memorizes the training data. You want the model to general, generalize well on unseen data. If you provide new images to the model, it should be able to deal with those and give you good results, um, no matter whether it has seen them before or not. Therefore, you have to be a little bit careful and there's different data sets involved. There's a training data set, there's a validation data set, and there's a test data set. Um, we can talk about those later. The training one basically is the one based on which your model learns. And for now, this is the most important one, okay? And then validation is used for, I think it's even on here. Yeah, stop before overfitting sets in. The validation data set is basically used to check has overfitting already happened? Did I pick the right hyperparameters? So hyperparameters are parameters of your model that are not being learned. 
And then once you're done, you can test your model on the test data set. Okay? That's already a lot of stuff. That's like a lecture of deep learning in, in like 10 minutes. Okay. Because it's so much fun, we will now look at some code. So if you have your laptop, you don't have to follow this on your laptop, right? You can simply watch and enjoy the show. Um, but I put the code here on my GitHub repo, so you can pull it up from there. There is a Colab launcher, and there is a binder launcher. Let me show you. So if you go to that, does everybody have the link? So it needs more time? Okay. So this is what it looks like. Um, who, ha who has never seen GitHub before? It's good? Everybody's familiar with GitHub? Okay. So you, you don't really have to use GitHub here or Git or anything. All you need is those two buttons here. So you can launch the notebook with either one of those two buttons. If you have a Google account, I would advise you to use the Colab launcher. So Colab is a service by Google that allows you to use their computers in the cloud. Um, Binder, that's the other one that's the alternative without Google, um, that also works. There's one big difference between the two because Google has so many GPUs laying around because, because they're updating their systems all the time they can provide you free use of a GPU for a specific amount of time. And for this, what we're doing here, this is just what you need, okay? It will make the training much faster and it will um, allow you to actually do some stuff with the code. Okay, so I will open the Colab launcher. Can you guys read this? Okay. Bigger? In font? No. Okay. All right. So, um, the code, does it work with the microphone? Okay. Um, the code that I will show you um, is very similar to what we used in a uh, tutorial at iGARS a couple of weeks ago. So um, there we had a tutorial uh, on a full day. I kind of condensed that into a three hour lecture here. Um, but I also I shortened it a little bit. But if you're interested in the full thing, here you have a link um, to the, the full tutorial and you can look at the other examples that we provided there. The idea in the end is the same. So. Right, we will use PyTorch and we will use PyTorch Lightning and we will use a data set that we presented at iGARS, uh, we call it Benji, that's, um, I, will, I will talk about it later, okay? I have some slides on that. Anyway, what we do now, um, or what we do in this notebook is first we will set up this supervised learning pipeline. So that's the first big block here and then we will talk about different methods for data efficient learning. We'll talk about data fusion, multitask learning, transfer learning, and a little bit about self-supervised learning. So I can give you some, some code for that, um, but it's training that takes a huge amount of time and it takes a really big data set. The data set that we're using here only has 800 samples, so 800 um, samples containing Sentinel-2, Sentinel-1 imagery, or Sentinel-2 imagery, Sentinel-1 uh, polarization data, and um, elevation information, land cover, land use, climate zone information. I will show you in a bit. Right, but it's a really small data set, and therefore, I put this in here. Um, we're <laughs> I'm presenting this because um, I'm, I'm, I'm claiming that this allows efficient learning, but as you will see, um, the results show 
based on this tiny little data set that it doesn't really help. It just makes it worse. But trust me, if you have a bigger data set, it actually works. And I will show you some examples that it actually works. But because we're running this on Colab here, we need a really small data set. Otherwise, we will sit here all day just waiting for your model to stop training. OK, so now we'll talk about the first part. We'll talk about the supervised learning pipeline so that we have like a basic building block on top of which we can then use and implement these other methods here. Is everybody doing fine? Ready? OK, then let's go. So what we need. Um, so first we have to define the task that we, want to, that we want to solve. And in this case, we use the task of climate zone classification based on Sentinel-2 imagery. So this is kind of basic, I would say. So Sentinel-2 imagery, um, it's, that's multi-spectral imagery, so it's not really multimodal yet, um, just to keep it simple. And um, climate zone classification is meant in the way that for each of those patches, each of those two, uh, 800 patches that we have in this little data set, we know where it is located and we know what the corresponding climate zone is. So the data set is focusing on Europe, um, so there's only eight different climate zones, eight, 12, maybe 12, 12 different climate zones in there, um, just to keep it simple, okay? But the task should be clear. I mean, it stretches all the way from somewhere in Norway all the way down to, to Portugal. So there is some variation in there. So the task of the model is to predict based on the Sentinel-2 image, what is the climate zone that we're looking at? Okay, just to, just to give you an idea. So this is the task and we need a model. Yeah? The climate zone? Yeah, it's, it's um, it's a single label multi-class problem. So we have one label, which is climate zone, and we have 12 different classes. No, no. thank you. Okay, so we have the, the problem specified. Now we need an architecture. So for a problem like this, in research, I would use something like a ResNet, if you're familiar with that. That's a residual neural network. It comes out of the box, it's implemented. You can simply load it in PyTorch and it works most of the time. All right, so you don't have to build your own architecture for this. For this um, tutorial here, however, we, we will build a UNet, which if you're familiar with this, doesn't really make sense because the UNet is a um, segmentation network or it's mostly used as a segmentation network, but in the end it doesn't matter. We can use any backbone, so the backbone is like the, the model architecture. You can use any backbone you like, okay? Okay, so before we get started with anything, we have to set up our environment. So there's a bunch of stuff we have to import and even install. So for instance, PyTorch Lightning, um, Torch Matrix, Elementation, Raster I.O., we have to install in your um, Colab environment, and then we can import it. So, has everybody used Colab before? You have. Who, who has never? Okay, you haven't. <laughs> okay, let me let me show you, to you how it works. It's really simple. So, you know, you don't know what this is. Uh, any of this? Okay, good. So, a notebook is basically a file that contains text and it contains code. So you can run those notebooks for different um, programming languages, and the most common is Python, right? So you have those text parts here that are like a notebook, you write in stuff, but then you also ha have these cells. So those are all cells. There's markdown cells for text or text cells, and there's code cells. And you can run these cells, right? And so if you run this, it will be run on a Google computer, so not on your machine. That's important. So therefore, it doesn't matter. You could use any old computer, but 
the code runs fine because it runs on a Google computer. So all you have to do for running this is either you click on the little play button here. First it asks you, ooh, I don't know the author of this. You, don't, you can't trust that guy. Um, please trust me. <laughs> I think you can. You should. Ah, okay. Um, we'll talk about this here in a second. So you'll see here it says Initializione, blah, 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 connecto, and here we go. So you should see something like this here with RAM and disco. That's nice. <laughs> so that's Italian. There's no disco. <laughs> um, right, so you should have this at some point. So this is basically your little Google computer somewhere on this planet. And you run your code, your notebook, runs on this little computer. So you see now here is a green check mark. So this cell has been run. And whatever is in the cell is now in the memory of that computer. right? Now you can run different cells, and they all execute some code. And this will all happen in the memory of that computer. Does this kind of make sense? OK, so it's, it's a really nice way, especially for setups like this here. Nobody has to install software. You just use it there. But you might as well simply download this notebook and run it locally on your computer. OK? So there is a bunch of stuff that we import. I'm just going to skip it. If you have questions, maybe we can talk about it later if you're really interested in the details. So it's a lot of stuff we have to install a little bit. Now this here is also important. So this will check whether this file here, Benji 800 tar GZ, is available in this environment. I'm pretty sure it's not because it, why, why would it be there? So what it does is it will download this file into your environment. Again, not on your computer but into this Google computer, OK? So let's do this. And you will see that it's actually pretty fast. Here we go. So it's 183 megabytes um, that we downloaded. So this sits on my Google Drive. And you download it from there. Because both is Google, Google Drive, Google Colab. The download is super quick. So this is one big advantage of, of using Colab, because you can really quickly download things. OK, so we downloaded the data. So what is Benji 800? So it's this little data set with 800 locations with co-located Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 multispectral data, and so on. Um, there is a much bigger data set. I will talk it talk about this in, in a bit. So this is really just a tiny little fraction so that we can process it in time here for this tutorial. So we downloaded it. Now what we can do is we can unpack it. We can untar it. So this is really just opening the this file is a tar file, is a tar ball, and then it extracts everything. And now what you can do is you can go to the left here. There's this file browser. And here you see that you should be able to see this Benji 800 now. So there is the tarball, the gzip tarball, Benji 800. And then where the mouse pointer is, here you have the unpacked data. And if we go in here, you will see there's different types of data. If we go to Sentinel-2, takes a while. And you have those different um, directories. And each of those contains the different bands, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. OK? So what we did so far is we simply downloaded the data, we unpacked the data. So now we can actually do something with the data, something useful. So. Let's get rid of this. OK, so far so good. Now we want to use the data. We have the data. We want to use the data. So to 
use the data in PyTorch, we have to build a data set class. This, is, this looks more complicated than it is. Um, a data set class, it's a class in Python. It inherits from data set. And in the end, it has to contain three methods. It has to contain a constructor. This is the init method here. It has to contain a get item method. And it has to contain a length method or length attribute, right? That gives you the length of the, the entire data set. There's more stuff in here, but those are mainly helper functions. So for instance, loading different types of data or loading um, or visualizing the data. We're not gonna bother with that at this moment, okay? So, in the constructor, basically what happens is the class will simply figure out, okay, uh, it will set some, some parameters. Here's some, what are the, the bands that you're interested in? You can provide that to the constructor here as a keyword argument. By default, we use all Sentinel-2 bands. We use all Sentinel-1 bands, because why not? Yeah, but in the end, what you could do is you could kick out some of the, the data from here. And um, some more stuff. We set the um, land use land cover label names here, tree cover, shrubland, grassland, and so on. And we read some data files, like the meta file that has a lot of information in it, and so on. Here, and also set some resampling factors. The interesting part is really here, the, the get item method. So in the way PyTorch will use this data set class is that um, it will take an instance of the data set class with the different data defined by you as a user, and then it will um, use this get item function to basically extract individual samples. Right? And for each sample, it expects a dictionary that contains whatever data you want. Right? Whatever data you want to put in there. But only for a single sample. Then PyTorch internally has those data loaders that will um, turn a list of samples into something that is easier to use for PyTorch. It will kind of convert it back into a list of, of elements for each of the um, um, data modalities or inputs that you have in here to make it more efficient. The good thing is we don't have to care about that because this is all being taken care of. This is, sometimes it's, it's hard to, to explain why, have we, why do we have to do it this way? Why do we have to do that stuff? Because it's easier later, but you have, you kind of have to go through this here. Yeah? So, all that happens here is really just loading a single element from, or a single sample from our data set. Here we extract the Sentinel-2 information, we extract the land use land cover label, we extract the land use land cover mask, we extract uh, climate zone information, so this is what we will use as our target in, in this specific case. And then we put it all together into a uh, dictionary. So that contains Sentinel-2 map, land use, land cover, and so on. And Sentinel-1 information if Sentinel-1 data is requested. So that's basically it, right? It puts everything together into a dictionary. Then the length function that will simply tell you or tell PyTorch how many data samples there are in this data set. And then we have some helper functions. This deals with the Sentinel-2, so it will use Raspberry-O to load the TIFF images and um, uh, upscale them appropriately because uh, some of the bands, as you know, have 10 meter resolution. Some of the bands have um, 60 meter resolution. So that this upsampling is used so that all images have 10 meter resolution, right? So there's interpolation going on. Sentinel-1 is a bit easier, and then for the different 
yeah, here, uh, land use, land cover, it will simply read the information from the data set and so on. Okay, it's a lot of stuff. I know it's a lot of code. You don't have to understand everything of that, yeah? Just get a high level understanding, yeah? For the name of the method? Um, so the names for the get item in it, the constructor. So this oh, no. Um, so yeah, so these look kind of funny because they, they start with those two um, um, yeah. under underscore. underscore. Thank you, yes. So these are Python internal. You have to use those. You have to stick to those namings. So for init and for get item, you have to stick to it. And same for length, right? Because those are reserved names. That's why they have those funny underscores. So that nobody would ever get the idea, oh, I, I will name my method like this because it looks funny. But for your helper function, you can name them whatever you want. There is like a unwritten law that's things that you would call private in C or so that you do not want to expose to a user of your class. You could call it something underscore, single underscore only, and then whatever name you want. But it's, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay, a lot of stuff. Let's simply run it. So you can run, I showed you, you can click on the play button or you simply do shift and enter. That's much faster, especially when you're typing, this is pretty convenient. Okay, so we created the data set class. We haven't done anything with it. Similarly, we will now build a data module, it's called, that is lightning, right? Py PyTorch lightning is that layer that sits on top that makes a bunch of stuff easier in the development, but it also has, comes with its yeah, red tail that, of things that you have to do. So for instance, you have to set up this data module here. In the end, you simply specify um, in here what is the data set that you want to use. It's the data set class that we just defined. I should use this screen. <laughs> um, and you define the different data sets or the, the splits. So here we define our data set. This is the entire data set of 800 images. And then we will split this into a training and a validation data set, okay? So for training, we will use 75% of the 800 images, so that's 600. And then for validation, we will use 200 images. Oh, sorry. Training, validation, and then validation and test. So 600 images for training, 100 for validation, 100 for testing. Then we provide some, or define some batch sizes here. And then here, the data loaders, that's basically what I mentioned before, um, that will take samples, a list of samples, list of dictionaries, and turn it into a list of lists so that it's easier to process. So a lot of heavy lifting of loading the data is actually done by those data loaders here. But that all happens in the background, right? If, if I would have to code this all by myself, training a network would take a couple of weeks. But with this infrastructure here in place, it will only take a couple of minutes, right? Because a lot of people who really know their stuff spend a lot of time making this to work. So for instance, what we define here in these data loaders is that there's actually four workers, so like four independent instances of these programs in the background compiling the data while you're training a mini batch. So you're training one thing, and in the background, these workers are already loading the data from disk for the next iteration. So that will make it way more efficient. Okay, so we need data loaders for the training, validation, test data set. Okay, so we can run this so that the class is defined. So far, we only defined those classes, the data set and the data module. We haven't done anything with it. That happens now. 
So what we do here is we set a seed value. Who doesn't know what a seed value is? A seed value, um, a lot of stuff that will happen in the training of this um, neural network is based on random processes. It's stochastic processes, okay? So what we have in PyTorch, it, what you have in your computer is a random number generator, okay? So you want to generate those random numbers so that you can model a random process. So the seed value is basically a starting point where you start um, pulling random numbers from, okay? You still get random numbers, but let's put it the other way around. If you all ask your computer, if you all ask Python to give you a random number, every single computer will give you a different answer. But if you all use the same seed value and you ask your computer for a random number, you will all get the same answer, okay? If you ask it again, it will give you every single one again the same random number. Um, this may sound kind of weird because it doesn't feel random anymore, but if you look at the distribution of those random numbers, they are still random. They just simply follow a specific order. And that is important because only that, only fixing the seed value will allow you all to um, get uh, reproducible results. Because otherwise, every single one of you would get a different result, and you can't compare those results, okay? So we have to set the seed value. Price question, I'm asking this every single one of my students, why is it 42? <laughs> Historical? What is the history behind it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Which book? Exactly. Thank you, because a lot of my students at the University of St. Gallen have never heard about this book before. It's a piece of information that everybody has to know. So you could use any number you want, but computer scientists are geeks, therefore they use something meaningful, and what is more meaningful than 42? But really, it doesn't make a difference. You could use 43. We just have to agree on the same number, okay? Okay, so we fix the seed so that we all get the same results. We define the batch sizes, so that is how many samples do we put in one of those mini batches for training, it's this here, and for evaluation or validation, yeah? And we use 32. Um, then we define the data module, so we, we instantiate it here and then we set it up, here's where the data sits, this is the training batch size, this is the evaluation batch size, okay? So this is all just setting things up. So here, Lightning tells us the global seed set to 42. Global seed means we need a seed for anything NumPy, um, that's stuff that runs on the CPU, anything uh, CUDA that runs on the GPU, and there's one more thing in between, but I forgot what it was. Okay, now that we got all this, uh, we can visualize an example. So this is a random location. Um, Okay, so you probably saw it in the data set class, there's this visualize observation method, and basically this outputs this here. So here we have Sentinel-2, RGB. Here we have um, the land use, land cover map. This is the climate zone. It's just a numeric code in this case. Um, a season encoding, we call it, so that's simply a number from zero to one, where zero is winter, one is summer. So this is somewhere in spring or in fall. And, yep, the segmentation mask. So this is 
index, data set index 100, we could put any number between zero and uh, 600 in here. Let's try 50. And that looks like this, that's interesting. So that's some fields. And there's a tiny little speckle that is something else. Yes? This contains everything, yeah. So this is the sample that comes from the data set class. So that contains all the things that we defined up here. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Here, everything in here. So the sample contains Sentinel-2, land use, land cover mask, the patch ID, longitude, latitude, the top land use, land cover map, season, and climate zone. And, Um, we will use only part of this later. But the data set class is set up in such a way that it provides everything, and then later you will see we will have to define a different class where we basically specify, use this as input and th that as output. Okay. Okay, sounds good? Yeah. For climate zone classification? I only have said half of it. Ah, okay. So the question is, what is the data set that we use for climate zone in, in Europe? So um, you can look that up in the paper. Um, I will show you in a bit, but the, the, the short answer is there was a paper back at all 2018. They did like a global mapping of climate zones currently in 50 years and in 100 years, something like that, including like the most likely climate change um, scenarios. And it's really just, it's a big raster image of the entire world and you can simply, what we did is we simply pulled it from there. So it's the Köppen-Geiger schema that is used there for climate zones. And since we only have a very limited amount of those climate zones, I think it's like 47 in total, uh, we only have 12 different ones in this data set here because it's based on Europe. Another question? Yeah, so the, I didn't mention that because I will, I will have a slide on that later. The, the data set Benji is based on Big EarthNet. That's why it's B-E-N, Big EarthNet, and then uh, G-E for geographical and environmental information. So in the end, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-1 is the same as Big EarthNet, and they have level 2A data. In theory, you can, but you have to stick then to the level 1C. Yeah, I mean, or whatever you want to train. I mean, you, you, you can take any data level product you want, um, but you have to stick to it in the future then. So, Michael, just to say that mm -hmm. it's better if you take a very close to the microphone because they are using this to, re okay. to record. And uh, if it's possible to to make uh, like uh, the questions like in the end of each uh, uh, okay. slot. Otherwise, no, the voice from the students is not recorded. Ah, okay. okay but or should I you, read no, the no, question? No, you, you know. Yeah. But the, the okay. Okay, so let, let's do questions then at, at the end uh, of, I, I, will, I will tell you when it's a good time to have questions, sorry. Okay, good, so we have the data. Um, now we wanna set up our model. So data, 
our model, which is basically the backbone, so it's some type of architecture that does the, the feature extraction, basically. And we have a little head that will, it, that's just another little uh, neural network in the end. In, in most cases, or in this case here, it will be just um, some fully connected layers at the end of our backbone, because the backbone is a unit type encoder. So the output of that is basically a map, right? And you want to turn that map into something that has um, a single number with 12 different values because we have 12 different um, cl uh, climate zone classes, right? And that is then our output, okay? So this is what we, now we're looking at the architecture. Oh, there's one thing I forgot. Um, before we move on, please check if you really have a GPU available. So you can go to runtime here, and then should be this one. No, 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 I don't want this. This here? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So whatever it is in your language, it's um, change runtime type. It's called in English. So here. Um, the runtime should be Python 3. There shouldn't be any differences here. But for you, this should look a little, little bit different um, because I'm using Colab Pro. There should be CPU and GPU available. Do you see that? Something with GPU? GPU and maybe even TPU. Forget about the, the TPU. We don't need that. But you should check the TPU. Oh, no, actually, no. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, yeah. So you should have a GPU available. Um, otherwise, training would take too long. OK, good. So the architecture is PyTorch. We have to build a class again. So we built uh, different classes here to, to build our model. In the end, we have a um, class here for a so-called convolutional block. So each of those. Um, modules or network modules, they all look the same. Um, they have a constructor again that allows you to specify the architecture. So in this case here we can specify how many input channels we have, how many output channels, and how many, uh, if there's any channels in between. And we have a forward function, right? Those are the two, or methods, we have two methods in those classes here. That's important. The forward method and the constructor. So in the constructor, we basically specify all the different um, building blocks that we want in our network. So here we have a sequence of a convolutional layer, batch norm, relu, that's our nonlinear activation function, convolution, batch norm, relu. Okay? This all in a sequence, and then basically um, what the forward method does, it simply runs our input through this construct here, double conf we call it, so that's the entire sequence. Okay? We can have some questions on that in, in a minute. So this is like the t smallest building block, it's called a convolutional block. Then here we define a down convolution, so here we use this convolutional block um, in combination with a max pool operation. So that allows you to basically make the feature map smaller and extract some information from it. And then we have some up convolution that does the exact opposite, so you uh, increase the size of your, um, uh, of your feature map again by a factor of two. And then we plug everything together, and this is basically what the unit does. You have your input, you have some down convolutions to decrease the feature size, and then you're scaling this up again to the original feature map size. And along the way, the model can learn um, things and apply different, um, or extract different features in the down sampling part and then in the up sampling part, okay? This is a very specific architecture. We chose it because it, you can use it for classification and for segmentation. It doesn't really make a big difference. 
Um, but you could use, you could really use any architecture you like in here. You could put two convolution layers and two um, linear layers together. Fine, that would do the trick. Okay, so here we define the components again in the constructor and then in the forward method we, um, we uh, apply the different operations and we define the sequence. Okay, so this is the, what we call our backbone, so that's the main feature extractor. And then on top of that sits a little head, that's this little extra neural network that basically is tailored to a specific task since we're interested in um, single label multi-class classification. And the output of our backbone is a feature map because it's a segmentation network. We have to make the two work together. And therefore what we can do, oh, I have to run this. Sorry about that. Right, what we do here is we define our multi-class classification head. So uh, we define a convolution layer and then a linear layer in combination with dropout and we put the two together. So we take uh, what comes out of our backbone, we run it through a convolution layer, then we linearize the output so that we can use it in a linear layer and then we run through the linear layer and get the result, okay? So this is really just to make the output of the backbone work with our target. Right, so we define the head and then we plug everything together and this is really just our backbone, that's the unit that we defined previously and our head this is the multi-class classification head, and we plug the two together and that's it, right? So that's the beauty of PyTorch, kind of, that you can define those building blocks, you can arrange them in different ways, and you can simply uh, replace them, right? I mean, I, I have students, they don't even, when, when they code their stuff, they don't even um, write new code anymore, they, they only change parameters in their config file and they can do whatever they want. And, and to me, that's like magic. But it works. If you do it properly, if you do it consistently, then um, you can do that. Okay, questions on the architecture? Or how to define those, those classes or anything? It makes sense if you play with it for a while. It's really not that difficult. Again, you have to stick to the rule that there must be a forward method and there must be a constructor. You define all the blocks in the constructor. You plug them all together in the right order in the, um, in the forward method, and that's it, okay? Okay, good. So now we have our architecture, we have the data. Now we can start the training process, okay? So first we have to make sure that we really have a GPU. So if you run this cell here, it will check whether there's a um, GPU available. If there is one available, it will tell you this here, uh, device used CUDA zero. CUDA is the um, NVIDIA proprietary language run on GPUs. If there is a CUDA device, it simply means there is a GPU that understands CUDA. So you can run um, things on your GPU. Now we have to define some more PyTorch Lightning stuff because here you can easily get lost in the details. With Lightning, it's a little bit easier. Um, it takes care of a lot of stuff, but um, you also have to define a bunch of things. So we have to define this metric tracker that will basically um, extract the metrics like accuracy. That's what we're mostly interested in here. Um, during the training process, it will extract that from the training process. And then we have to define a trainer method, uh, sorry, trainer class. So it's called classification unit trainer. And so in the constructor, we provide to it a model. So that's a network instance. Criterion, that's our loss function. 
an optimizer, that's the optimizer that we're gonna use, and a scheduler if you wanna use one. I'll explain in a second what those are. We simply store them here, we define some metrics, and then here we define a forward method for the trainer, so that's basically what happens in each forward pass. Well, simply take the image or input and pass it through your model, so that's easy enough. Here we can configure the, the optimizer, so we use um, a scheduler if there is one. We're interested in, in training by epochs, you could also use um, um, iterations here. Um, the last function, that's simply the criterion, but you could here, for instance, you could plug in your own last function if you want one. Get target, so this is kind of important. Here we define how do we get the target. So there was this question, um, if we're gonna use all the um, information from the samples, from the sample dictionary in the training process. No, so here you really define our target is only climate zone from the sample, okay? And we kind of disregard all the rest. We don't need it. So this is our target. And then the training step, this is important and we will change that in the next sessions. We will change this here, uh, tailored to each application and tailored to each um, learning process that we use. So we define here our um, target. So this comes from the get target method. So this retrieves the target, this is the climate zone simply, and then data is really just the Sentinel-2 data. Okay? So Sentinel-2 out of the training batch, then we run our network, we do a forward pass on data, the input data. This is our output. And then we can, um, calculate or compute the, uh, the training metric and the training loss. And then we put everything into our, um, or we log everything, and then that's basically it. And what is returned is the training loss. So what happens in here, in the background, so, sorry, this is the training step, there's a validation step, and there's a test step. They all look the same, because we do the same thing, right? Um, but what is implicit, implicitly defined here is that for the training step, we do the, um, we calculate the gradients of the loss with respect to the weight parameters, and we update the weights. Of course, this is not done as part of the validation step or the test step, right? So this is something to keep in mind, but um, it's also nice because Lightning takes care of that, right? You don't have to take care of that. Lightning does it for you. So you don't even have to think about it. I've had every single student uh, spending at least a week, if not two weeks of their time, trying to figure out why their model doesn't work and all they didn't do was to set their model back from eval mode into uh, train mode. So that's a detail in PyTorch. I think everybody has made that mistake. Everybody does it once, but if you're supervising students, they will all do the same mistake at some point. I've done it, it took me two weeks to figure it out. This does not happen with Lightning, because Lightning takes care of that, okay? So it's, it's not really foolproof, but it's harder to make really bad mistakes. Okay, so there, there's a lot of stuff in here, but um, it kind of makes sense, because everything is there. And now we define the final parts. So we define our model. So this is an instance of our classification unit. That's the architecture that we defined earlier with 12 input channels because we have 12 Sentinel-2 channels and with 12 classes because we have 12 different climate zones, right? So it's just a coincidence that both are 12 here. We define our criterion, which is use cross entropy loss a learning rate, 10 to the minus four, an optimizer we use stochastic gradient descent with a fixed learning rate um, of 10 to the minus four, what we defined here. A scheduler, we use a cosine annealing scheduler, simply because it seems to work nicely. 
we define a trainer instance where we provide all those things to the trainer, so the trainer takes care of the training part. We define a metrics class, and then here for the trainer we pass uh, the accelerator, what we want to use, the GPU. Uh, we want to train for five epochs. Um, the callbacks here so we can pull out the metrics from the training process. And here default root directory, this simply will write the most recent trained checkpoint to this directory here. So the, if you want to use it later, if you want to keep it for later, you can simply get it from here. So if we run this, nothing happens. But then, finally, we can train our model, right? It was a long way, there's a lot, a lot of steps we have to follow, but here we can use the fit function from our trainer, and that um, will use the model trainer on the training data set and the validation data set. And if we run this here, this actually takes a while, Though it's, uh, although it's only a tiny data set. Oh, okay. I forgot to run a few things. Okay, here we go. Now it's running. So there's a lot of information provided here. So for instance, you see the, the model that is being used as our classification unit. It actually has 17.4 million parameters. It's kind of small. It's, it's not a big model, but it's still already 17.4 million parameters. We use cross entropy loss as our criterion, and then the different metrics that the model looks at. And we see the first epoch of training is done. Yeah, it takes a while. I, I'll, I'll simply move on. Um, and um, yeah, once or yeah, if you let it run, you can get the um, the, the plots for the loss and the accuracy, and they look like this. So we have the losses on the left, accuracies on the right. In blue, uh, sorry, in, in orange, we have the training data set. So the training loss decreases. That's a good sign. This is exactly what the model is supposed to do. For every mini batch, the loss decreases. And even better, it does the same for the validation data set. So it is possible, for instance, that for the training data set, your loss decreases, but for the validation data set, so those two are independent, I should mention it. Those two are independent, so the model uses this to change the gradients, or sorry, uses this to change the, the weight parameters. And the validation data set, it only uses for validation purposes. It never uses them in the training. That's the important thing here. The model has never seen those images here, right? It's a, it's a separate data set. So what you want is a model that generalizes well where your um, loss on the validation data set also decreases. Only then your model generalizes. It, it is possible, for instance, that the training loss decreases, but the validation loss goes up, which simply means the model starts to overfit. The model starts to memorize your training data set because it gets better and better and better on the training data set, but on the validation data set, which is independent, it learns nothing, right? It's kind of useless, and this would be a useless model. Similar for the accuracy, so the training accuracy, um, sorry, the, the accuracy on the training data set improves, and more so on the uh, validation data sets. On the validation data set, we get an accuracy of like 37%, something like that, and um, that's okay, we only train for five epochs. I mean, if you look at these plots, you can probably continue training for a bunch of epochs and get better results. So we can also evaluate our data set on the test data set, just to get another independent data set to see how, how good the model performs. And here we get an, um, 
So then, yeah, get an accuracy of 45%. It sometimes changes a little bit. So 45%, this is actually better than the 37% that we get on the validation data set. That's simply because this is a really small data set. Okay. Okay. Um, I see it's almost 11. When, when do we do the coffee break? At 11, okay, so then, um, do I have another five minutes? Okay, okay, good. Okay, questions. So this is really the supervised learning pipeline. That was a lot of stuff. I promise later you will have seen a lot of the things that it will come later, you have seen them already, right? And then I will only point out the differences. We will talk about the different methods. So the, the really interesting part starts now. We'll talk about the different methods, uh, theoretically, and how do you implement it in, in PyTorch. Um, that will be a little bit more fun, I guess. But are there questions related to this? Uh, just to find this is for me. Okay. This is for me. All right. I feel like a rock star. Okay. Okay. Just a tiny technical detail about the scheduler. Mm -hmm. What does that? Ah, sorry, I didn't mention that. Yeah. What yeah. is a scheduler? Um, so let me go back here. Um, here, where we have all the different ingredients for our trainer. So this is where the scheduler shows up. So we define a scheduler here with a cosine annealing. Um, Scheduler. If you don't use a scheduler, the optimizer, stochastic gradient descent, will use a single learning rate. Okay? It's basically what you define. What you define here, the 10 to the minus 4. Uh, ah, yes. So it would be fixed to 10 to minus 4 for the entire learning process. But um, you can show that it's actually beneficial for a model, for the learning of a model to change that a little bit. So the scheduler um, decreases the learning rate in every epoch. And here you define a, a maximum uh, epoch, I think at 300, if you train for 300 epochs, the, the learning rate would be zero. We, we train only for five epochs, so this, that doesn't really affect us. But in the end, what happens is that for every um, epoch, the learning rate decreases a little bit. And I mean, it kind of makes sense if you make those big jumps in weight space, it's, it's hard to find the, the, the optimum. Um, especially when you're close to it, you might jump across it every once in a while. Um, but if you decrease the learning rate, then it's possible to get closer and closer and closer. Yeah. So it, it, it seems to work pretty, pretty well. Other questions? We need the setup. Uh, thank you for your lesson. Um, I don't have seen the, this data set, but I think you have a problem of class imbalance, so it would be nice to see how to handle these cases. Yeah, um, you're right. We have a class imbalance here, um, like in, in most real world data sets. Um, how would we handle this? Um, what you could do, I mean, in this case, it would be easy to simply pick samples in such a way that you have every climate zone um, represented by the same number of samples. This would be easy because uh, the, the entire data set is 590,000 samples. This is 800 of them, super easy. Um, for, for this specific tutorial, we simply don't care about it because that's, I think that would be a, a, a kind of a lecture series in itself, how you, how you can solve that. But yeah, evenly sampling would be a good idea. Um, another thing that we tried recently was to use something like um, estimated calibration errors. So if you know um, that there's confusion between different classes in your data set. You can use that information and implement it into the model to get a more balanced um, 
representation. Um, that is one way um, you could weight your loss function appropriately so that over-represented classes are less important in the model training process. There's a bunch of methods out there, but yeah, they all have their benefits and the, their downsides, so it, it, it really depends. For this year, it really doesn't matter because the, the results will be bad either way. <laughs> because the data set is so small, not because the methods don't work, it's really just because we have a tiny little data set here. 